Praise the Lord. All right, so up as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study. Thank you for the faithfulness of your people. I thank you, Lord, for bringing us together every time like this, every week. I thank you for strengthening us by the study of the word. We're praying, Lord, today the seed of faith will be sowed in every heart. And this word will bring forth fruit in every life in Jesus' name. Those who are weak, make them strong. Those who are falling, restore them. And those who are battling with temptations and trials in life, we pray, Lord, your grace will flow into every life. They'll be able to stand in this day in Jesus' name. And we pray that the righteous standard of the world will be made plain and made clear to every heart and the strength and the power to follow through and live the life of the Christian and have the ministry of soul winning you grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, you'll keep us awake as we look at your word today and reveal great, deep mysteries of the word unto every heart today. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Welcome you to the Bible study tonight. It's always a joy as we come together to study the Word of God together. This has been going on now for many, many years, and there are faithful souls and faithful disciples, learners, who are yielding themselves to the study of the Word, and the more we take in this bread of life and the water of life, the more strength and the more grace and the more power, energy, spiritual energy comes into us. So that whatever we face and whatever is going on around us will be able to stand and do the will of God and abide obedient to the Lord for the rest of our lives till the end of life in Jesus' name. We've been studying the book of Daniel, and the book of Daniel is consecrated to prophecy, especially chapters 7 all through to 12. Of course, you know, as we have been going on in the study, we saw that chapter 2 also was a great, great prophecy. And in chapter 4, we found how Nebuchadnezzar discovered who God is and the power, the might of God, that righteous judge of all men till at the end of time. And uh, now we'll be coming through these prophecies from chapter 7, 8, 9, and now we'll come to 10. And as we come to chapter 10, we're actually coming to the conclusion of the book. We're not at the end yet, but we're coming to the conclusion. You'll find out that chapter 10 is an introduction to the rest of the book. We have chapter 11, very long, 45 verses, and it's still still revealing just the same prophecy. And then chapter 12 climaxes everything and concludes everything about the prophecies of Daniel. Now, there's something you'll find about Daniel. It is very, very special that these prophecies we're looking at from chapter 10 to chapter 11 and chapter 12, they actually sweep the time of the end. That is, from the time of Daniel all through to the New Testament time, the times of the Gentiles, and then to the time of the resurrection. Think about that. That is the resurrection of the dead. As you think about the prophecy of Daniel, that he gives us the details of what the Almighty God has in his plan. And the program of the Almighty God, then of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ as King of kings and the Lord of lords. And it goes on to the time of the resurrection of the dead, the time of the great tribulation, the time of the very end, when the kingdom will be established by the Lord. Let me just uh, go on and show you the very end in Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. I'm reading from verse from verse 1. In Daniel chapter 12 verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble as ne such as never was since there was a nation, even to the same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found reaching in the book. That's talking about the time of the great tribulation. That's why I told you that the prophecy of Daniel sweeps from the time of Daniel until the time of the New Testament and until the age and the time in which we're living now and then until the very time of the end 
the time of the great tribulation. Look at verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, and some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. That means that the time also goes on until the time of the resurrection. Look at verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and day that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. That means then it goes to the time when God rewards those who have been born again and the faithful servants of God and the children of God and the saints of God. That tells you then that Daniel was a greatly privileged child of God, a greatly privileged saint of God. And the great revelations of the mysteries of the kingdom, they were all revealed to him. Tonight, we'll come to just the introduction, chapter 10. Look at chapter 10 now. I'm reading from verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true. But the time appointed was long. Think about that. It says all these revelations were reading from Daniel that the sin was true. Everything is going to be fulfilled to the letter. All the details of the kingdoms of the Gentiles, all the details of the time of the great tribulation, all the details of the abomination of desolation, all the times of, the, of that time when Christ will come and establish his kingdom. The Son of Man coming before the ancient of this. And Daniel is telling us by revelation that the scene is true. But then he said, but the time is long. That means it's going to take a very long time, thousands of years, before all the details of the prophecies will be fulfilled. In verse 1 it says, and he understood the scene. He understood. He had understanding of the vision. Let's look at verse 2. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning. Three full weeks, I ate no pleasant bread. Neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all. Till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Now, it tells us about the preparation for such a revelation that came to him. He said he was fasting. He was waiting upon the Lord. He ate no pleasant bread, neither did wine come up in his mouth. He did not even anoint himself. That he used to make himself very bright and very shaming. After all, he was even about 90 years of age. But at this time, he was looking up to the Lord because he wanted to know something. What was the matter now? Actually, at this time, Cyrus had announced that the Jewish people that wanted to return to their country, to their city, Jerusalem, and to Judah, they could return. But Daniel was disappointed. Even with that proclamation and announcement, and with the prayer he had prayed in chapter 9, and God had answered the prayer, and now the declaration, proclamation had been made for them to return to their land. Only few people returned. That was the first thing that shocked him. Why were the people staying back in Babylon? Why were they staying back in captivity? He needed to talk to the Lord. That's why he now went to prayer and he said, Lord, I'm sad. This is terrible. That we have, we have seen from your word, you are going to deliver your people. Now the people are delivered and they refuse to go back home. They became so used and so familiar with the life in captivity. It became their comfort zone. Everything around them now, they were not designing the pleasant land, the glorious land, and the land of promise anymore. That will bring sorrow to anybody. Sad. When you see a child of God, for example, that the liberty has come. Now you can worship the Lord. There is freedom of religion. You can come to the Bible study. You can come to the Sunday worship. You can come to the revival hour. And then something ties them down. And they're not willing to come. Where God is going to reveal his mind, the depth of his mystery unto them. That will bring sadness and sorrow to any heart. That's why now Daniel was waiting upon the Lord saying, This is a mystery. That deliverance has come. That liberty has come. And that the people are released to go back to their land. And they refuse to go back. There's another thing that happened to them. Actually, those who went back to Jerusalem. And Cyrus had said, those who want to build that temple again. Go ahead and build the temple of your God. And worship the God of the Lord Almighty. Then build the walls around Jerusalem. So that there will be protection and preservation. So that you'll be able to make sure that all those enemies you 
keep them outside the fence. And they began to build. If you have read Ezra and Nehemiah, you will know that God gave them divine intervention because of the intercession of the people of God. But now as they began to build, there were enemies that rose up. And they wanted to hinder the work. And because of that hindrance, when Daniel heard about that, he said, when will the people of God be free to do everything the Lord has called them to do? And then that will be able to build a temple that will be in honor and glory to the, maj to the majestic God. And because of that, he became sorrowful. That's why he was now waiting upon the Lord. And you know, there's something you learn about Daniel, and this is beautiful. Something we need to learn from. Many people, when they pray and fast, and they say they're waiting upon the Lord, and they're thinking of a personal need. They're thinking of a narrow kind of uh, attention to themselves. Uh, maybe about their health, about their wife, about their husband, about their children, about their business, about their personal, personal needs. In the case of Daniel, there was nothing like that at all. Have you noticed that when he prayed in chapter 9, he was praying for the nation. And now he comes to chapter 10 and he's praying for the people that are delivered from captivity and yet they're not going to make use of the liberty and the freedom and the deliverance the Lord has given them. That's why he prayed. How oh, you need to learn from that that will die to sell and die to self-centeredness and die to self-interest that every time you pray to not be your lord remember me again i've come again i have this need i have this thank you for what you did for me the other time but i come again for another scene think about other people Think about the Great Commission and think about the Kingdom of God and think about the nation so that our prayer will be like the prayers of Daniel. Our fasting will be like the fasting of Daniel. Our intercession will be like that of Daniel, concerned for other people, wanting them to know the Lord and wanting the Kingdom of God to expand and wanting the Great Commission to be fulfilled, wanting people to get saved and for the Kingdom of God and the Church of the Living God to become stronger and stronger. That's what we're learning here that Daniel prayed, he waited upon the Lord, he fasted, but it was not for himself, it was for the kingdom of God. And then he said, look at verse 2 again, he said, in those days, I, Daniel... I, Daniel, uh, we think about uh, somebody bringing the whole load of a whole nation upon his, sh his own shoulders that other people were not, in, were not concerned. Those captivities or those captives in Babylon, all, all they were concerned about was, I need to build a house. I need to possess land. I need to have, the, I need to have this. About Daniel, I, Daniel, I, Daniel, when other people will not join him, he didn't think, how can you bear the load of the nation alone? How can you carry the burden of the nation? alone. He carried it and he said I, Daniel, mourned three full weeks. Obviously there might be people that you might be saying, Daniel, go softly, go gently. Be gentle on yourself. Be soft on yourself. You're not a young man anymore. You're already approaching 90. And let pass it on to the younger people. Let the younger people do the fasting and the praying. But Daniel said, I'm concerned for the nation. And if no other person will bear the body of Daniel, Daniel was willing to bear the body upon his shoulders. Then he said, I ate no pleasant bread. Neither came wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself. Have you seen everything is personal? I, Daniel, myself. Now that came this in my mouth. It is beautiful. He wasn't thinking about other people. You know, there are some people, if they want to do something for the Lord, and other people are not bending down, carrying the load of them, then they say, well, am I the only one there? Am I the only one to carry the whole body of the whole ministry and the whole body of the whole nation? If all the other people will not join, after all, we're all Israelites together. And it's all our problems together. Why do they leave me all to eat by myself alone? Not Daniel. Daniel said, whether other people come or they go, they join or they don't join, this is a burden. Somebody must carry the burden. And he wanted to carry the burden. I pray that you will be the man of the hour in Jesus' name. You'll be the woman of the hour in Jesus' name. And then all this self-centeredness and thinking about ourselves. And if, you know, if it doesn't bring any personal gain to me, I'm not going to think about it. All that will cancel. And then we'll be able to say like Daniel, I bore 
I carried the burden. Now we're going to look at this message today is the conflict of nations and uh, heavenly powers. The conflict of nations and heavenly powers. Actually, when Daniel was thinking about it, he was thinking about the conflict in his own nation. The conflict of the people that went back to Judah. And the conflict of the people with the enemies that will not allow them to build the walls of Jerusalem or build the temple in Jerusalem. But then the Lord expanded it for him and said, you know, Daniel, it's not just the problem of Jerusalem, and it's not just the problem of Judah. It goes beyond the single nation. I'm going to show you something, and it is going to be the conflict of the nations and the heavenly powers. In this chapter, God reveals something to Daniel that you don't find in any other place. This is a deep mystery of the kingdom of God. We're going to divide the message to three parts. Number one, revelation after commitment to prayer with purpose of heart. Revelation after. That's how it always happens. You never have revelation before you commit yourself to prayer. It is after the prayer that you have with a great purpose of heart. That's then after that revelation will come. Point number two. Re resistance and conflict of princes in the heavenlies. Resistance and conflict of princes in the heavenlies. You know, as it is up there, so it is down here. Many people don't understand. And of course, uh, the rulers of this world and kings of this world and uh, the people that are doing whatever it is to control the affairs of the world, they never know. They think that everything depends upon themselves. Everything depends upon what that nation is planning, what that country is planning, what that empire is planning, or what that kingdom is doing. No! It's because of the conflict in the heavenlies. That's why you have the result over here on the earth. We'll see that when we come to point number two. Resistance and conflict of princes in the heavenlies. Point number three. Reassurance of conquering of the prince from heaven. Reassurance of conquering that no matter how the wind may blow and no matter how all the trials and the temptations and the troubles may rage, yet we are assured of victory. There is victory. Victory for the church of the living God and victory for the nation chosen by God. Victory for the saints of God. Victory for the kingdom. Reassurance of conquering with the prince from heaven. Point number one. We're looking at point number one. The revelation that came after commitment to prayer with purpose of heart. I'm looking at Daniel chapter 10. In Daniel chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 1. Daniel chapter 10. We're looking at verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Bethesda, and the thing was true. But the time was long, and he understood the scene and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, mourned three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread. Neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Stop there for a moment. What did it about this? And says, the third year of the king Cyrus. That's when he began to fast and wait upon the Lord. And that's when he mourned dearly. Now, let's, let's go back to the Old Testament uh, far back. Uh, let's look at uh, Chronicles. We're looking at Second Chronicles. In Second Chronicles, here you'll find what happened when uh, Cyrus uh, came over there, what declaration he made. And then you'll understand why Daniel was praying the prayer he prayed and why he was waiting upon the Lord. In Second Chronicles chapter 36, I'm reading from verse 22. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Remember that we are read in Daniel chapter 10, the prayer he prayed, waiting upon the Lord, mourning, fasting, and praying for the deliver, for the um, revival and renewal of the people of God. That was the third year, but now it says in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord, spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah, might be accomplished. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, and he made a pro Proclamation throughout all the kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all kingdoms of the earth, as the Lord God of heaven given me, and he has charged me to 
build him an house in Jerusalem, that which is in Judah, who is there among you or for this people, the Lord is God, be with him. Let him go up. He, de he declared that they were free. They could not go and build a temple to the glory of God for the worship of God in Jerusalem. And that was the first year. Now this is the third year. And Daniel saw the people did not respond. They were about building their own kind of mansion and their own houses and their own empires. And they were not concerned for the house of the Lord. That's the thing that pushed him to pray. And now as he prayed, let us look at it in verse 4. Daniel chapter 10 verse 4. And in the fourth and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hedekel, then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were guarded with fine gold of offers. Here we find Daniel as he was praying and praying. He prayed for the first day, no answer came. Second day, no answer came. And third day, no answer came. You know, when people are praying for themselves, they can continue for three, four, five, seven days. But when it's uh, praying for other people, if the answer does not come about a day or two, they say, well, I've done my best. I've prayed. I'm praying for them. I don't even know whether the people I'm praying for, whether they are concerned about their own problems themselves. If the answer has not come, maybe there's something in their lives. Maybe there's a sin or weakness in their lives. Maybe that's why the answer has not come. They give up. But in the case of Daniel, he was praying for his people. He was praying for Jerusalem. He was praying for Judah. He continued 21 days and no answer came. No response came from heaven. But then he still continued. If you are praying for other people, you don't see a change, a transformation, a turning around. Within a few days, do you continue praying? Do you continue waiting upon the Lord? And you continue to say, no, an answer must come. Although I'm not totally involved in this, but it's belonging to them, an answer still must come. Daniel was concerned for the glory of God. And because he was concerned for the glory of God, that's why he continued praying. And eventually, 21 days after, three weeks after, the answer now came, God sent a messenger from heaven. And this messenger that came from heaven, he had such a beautiful, majestic, and glorious look. Look at verse, verse 6. It says, his body also was like burial. And then his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to be po to polish brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. I, Daniel, alone, because I'm the one committed to prayer, because I'm the one doing the fasting, because I'm the one mourning for the nation. I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. And there were people with him, but they didn't have the same heart, the same passion, the same zeal. They didn't have the same purpose, the same focus. And even though they were together physically, but because they didn't have the same heart, it wasn't revealed unto them. God reveals himself to the people that are fire burning in their soul. And the people that have been zeal to see the glory of God. That's why it says, I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision. But a great quaking fell upon Upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore, I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me. There remained no strength in him. Why? Well, to start with, he's been fasting for three weeks, no physical strength. Not only that, the vision of the glorious personality from heaven came upon him, and that made him to lose some, some strength as well. That's why he said, I had no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength, yet had I the voice of his words. And when I had the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face. That means he fell down and my face toward the ground. That was the effect of that vision upon him. This vision came to Daniel in the third year of the reign of Cyrus. And he was assured of the truth of the matter. We read that in verse 1. He was also made to understand that the time of its fulfillment will be in the future. We read that in verse 1 where it says, The time appointed was long. And then it says, God granted this prophet to see great events concerning Israel, great events concerning the 
the nations of the world from the time of his time unto the end of the world and to the resurrection of the dead. That's what we read about in Daniel chapter 12 already from verses 1 to 3. Daniel received the revelation while he was mourning, fasting, and praying for his nation. His intensity of desire led to importunity in prayer. Because of the intensity of his desire, wanting to see the glory of God again, wanting to see the people of God restored unto their first love, and wanting to see the people of God worshipping God in spirit and in truth without any hindrance and without any resistance or opposition from the enemies. Because of that intensity of desire, he remained importunate in prayer. Daniel heard of the obstruction of the building of the temple by the enemies of God's people. That And that led him to sorrow of heart and fasting and intercession. True believers in Christ cannot but mourn and pray. When they see the work of God hindered, and when they see the salvation of souls delayed, though Daniel was now a very old man approaching 90 years of age, he had enough concern for God's glory in his nation that he fasted and prayed. Daniel, Daniel said denial and devotion shall encourage us and teach us and even influence us, inspire us, those of us who are much, much younger Longer than he was to consecrate and devote our lives, ourselves to God for spiritual welfare of God's people and the salvation of sinners in the world. I'm going to ask you some questions in your house fellowship. How many people do you see there that are not living the way they ought to live? No zeal, no power, no strength, no fire. And they're kind of lukewarm Christians. Those of them who are still Christians. How many backsliders do you know? Do you ever get concerned about them? Do you ever pray concerning them? Do you spend even about 10 minutes praying for those people? Do you ever spend one hour? Do you ever spend one day? Do you ever spend any time at all waiting upon the Lord and mourning and praying because of the sadness, because of the sorrow, knowing that these people, they are not making use of the privileges they have, the sacrifice of Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, the privilege of hearing the word of God, and the privilege of having revival in their soul. All the things the Lord made available for us. They are not making use of them. Are you ever concerned like Daniel? Do you ever show any body like Daniel? That's why we are studying this. It's not just to appreciate what Daniel did and say, well, Daniel did this and Daniel did that. What a great man of God he was. It's to influence us. It's to inspire us. It's to encourage us that as Daniel has done, we will do the same. We will do it in Jesus' name. The church in the district, the church in the group, the church in the region, the church in the state. What's the state of the church? The spiritual state. And what is the rate of growth in that local church where you are? I hear about all the problems that you hear about. Instead of talking about them, instead of gossip, gossiping about them, do like Daniel and have burden and carry the load and carry the burden of that local church and get on your knees and say, look, I'm hearing this, I'm hearing this, I'm seeing this, I'm observing this, and something must be done. What if you don't have any prayer partner? What if nobody will join you? What if nobody will see the need and see the burden like you see? You'll do like Daniel, you'll call upon the name of the Lord and say, Lord, something must be done. Revive your work in the midst of the years. Bring revival and let the people rise up and do something Thing, Lord, the lukewarmness must come to an end. The backsliding must come to an end. And the low level of spirituality among the people of God must come to an end. That's how Daniel prayed. That's why the vision came to him. That's why this great personality from heaven came to him. We're going to do the same thing. You know, revival will come in the real sense and revival will overflow the land if the believers will do like Daniel and will take the body, will take the challenge to the Lord and they will see many souls saved and believers strengthened and the sick healed and do so oppressed they'll be delivered when the believers will do like daniel and go to the lord in prayer with great great body after three weeks of fasting and praying a glorious personality from heaven appeared to daniel 
day supernatural being from heaven was close in linen, gathered with fine gold, and his body also was like beryl, that is, like a precious stone for of a, of a sky column. His face was as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire. His searching, piercing, penetrating eyes see the depths of all hearts with holy intelligence. He sees everything in the future as clear as everything in the past and everything in the present. He sees perfectly, nothing misses his searching eyes, his arms and his feet like in color to polish brass. His strong arms uphold the righteous and his white, hot, glowing, bronze feet crush the righteous in judgment. God cannot and will not condone sin. He will smash the rebellious and crush the unrighteous under his feet. And then we have read it already. He said the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. The thundering authority of his voice is enough to strike sinners' hearts with terror. A great quaking fell upon the people that is the other men that were with Daniel. Even though they didn't even see the personality. So that they fledged themselves to hide themselves. And you see what uh, we were read about there. This like the vision revealed unto John the beloved in Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Let's see the vision that came to John the beloved. And let's see the, the impact upon him too. And the response that he had. Revelation chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot, and girt about were paths with a golden girdle. His head and his, uh, his ears were white like wool, and as, as, uh, as a flame, it says, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Very similar to the revelation that Daniel saw. And so you will see that Daniel was a beloved, a beloved saint, and John, a beloved, a beloved disciple. And the Lord revealed deep, deep things, mysteries of the kingdom, of the kingdoms to come, unto Daniel as well as to John, the beloved. He tells us in verse, in verse 14, I'm reading that again, he said, And his ears were white at, like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they had burnt in a, in a furnace, and his voice as the voice of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. What was the effect on? John the beloved, when he saw this, we have seen the effect on Daniel already. He said, There was no strength in me. When I saw the vision, when I saw the revelation, and even the people around me, they quaked and they, they trembled and they ran away to hide themselves. How about John the Beloved? What was the impact upon him? Let us see in verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. That was the impact upon John, the beloved, when he saw this. Now, what's the impact upon us, upon you, upon me, whenever we see this great revelation? We're reading about it. What's the impact upon you? And what should be the impact upon us? Let's see the impact upon another person in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 1. You see those people, they had a very great and deep reverence for God. They were all stricken when they saw the great vision. And when they saw who God really was, they were not flippant, they were not frivolous, they were not careless, they were not insincere, they were not hypocritical. They saw the greatness of God, the majesty of God. They went on their faces, they went on their knees, and then they appealed to the Almighty God to do something within them so that the vision they saw will have a lasting impact upon them. Isaiah chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 1. 
the impact of the vision that Isaiah saw. You see, if you see a vision of the Lord, if you hear the voice of the Lord, and if you see what you've never seen before, you've heard what you've never heard before, it must have a, an impact upon you that will lead you towards God more and more. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord seeking upon his throne, high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim, each one had six wings and were twain. He covered his feet and were twain. He covered his feet and were twain. He did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. What was the effect on Isaiah? Then said, I woe is me. He saw his sinfulness. He saw the depravity. He saw the Adamic nature. He saw the self-centeredness. And he saw that he was not where he ought to be spiritually. When you hear the word of God, when you hear the voice of God, when you see the vision of the Lord, it shall have that same impact and influence upon your life. Then said, I woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean leaves, and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean leaves. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a light coal in his hand, which he had taken, or the tongues from up the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. An effect of holiness, righteousness, sanctification, and purity upon him, when he saw that great vision. Not only that in verse 8, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. That's the impact, that's the influence, that's the inspiration of the word of God. And the vision of the Lord had on those people of old. I pray that what we study and what we hear will have such a great impact upon every one of us in Jesus' name. We come to point number two now. Resistance and conflict in the Heavenless resistance and conflict in the heavenless. We're reading from Daniel chapter 10, from verse 10. Daniel chapter 10, we're looking at verse 10. It says in verse 10, And behold, an hand touched me. Remember now he was on the ground. He had fallen to the ground, no strength in him. He couldn't stand anymore because of that great vision. And behold, an hand touched me which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee. Hold on. Understand the words that I speak unto thee. If you go back to Daniel chapter 10, verse 1, the very beginning in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belshazzar, and the thing was true, and the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing. He understood the thing, and had understanding of the vision. But now, a messenger was sent from heaven, and in verse 11, he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee. You see, there are some people, if they have a basic understanding of the Word of God, they don't want to study the Word of God anymore. They say, well, I understand salvation. I know that. Sanctification, I can even tell you the details. Being baptized in the Holy Ghost, I know it already. And about the promise, I, I understand. I know it. And because of what they know, they don't want to go further and deeper and higher in the knowledge of the things of the Lord. But in the case of Daniel, verse 1 says, I understood. I had understanding in the whole matter. And I know it is true. And yet, he waited upon the Lord. And now he had deeper understanding. He had greater understanding. Because this great majestic personality from heaven came to him and said, I come to give you understanding. I pray that you will be like that.
that you'll be so humble that you'll not say, I know it all already. I understand it all already. I don't need any other teaching anymore. I understand all the basic truths of the word of God. Teach the younger people. But you see this, Daniel, you understood, and yet you wanted to know more. As you have understood, I pray there will be the desire you to want to know more in Jesus' name. And then it says, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he has spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then he says in verse 12, Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for upon the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. He said, From the first day you began to pray, I was already sent to you. And then why did you wait for three weeks, for 21 days before you came? Look at verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. One and twenty-one days. That's in the heavenly. That's not the real king of Persia. It's the angel, demonic angel in the heavenly. Representing the kingdom of Persia. Not wanting the will of God to be done in Persia. Not wanting Persia to help and aid and assist the people of Judah. Not wanting Judah to possess their possession. It was the demonic prince of Persia not wanting a good relationship between Persia and the people of Israel that then caused the resistance. Daniel was praying and praying and praying. The first week went and the second week went and now the third week and now the angel came and the angel said, you know the reason I've been delayed? You know the reason I didn't come in time? Because the prince of Persia, a human prince could not hold the angel or stand the angel. A human prince could not even see the past of the angel. It was a demonic prince of Persia. And then it says over here in verse, in verse 13, but lo, Michael one of the chief princes came to help me and I remember been there were the kings of Persia, the princes of Persia. And now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for what? Many days. Now we, we learn something here. You see, God was the people that are willing to wait, the people that are really concerned about the glory of God. Daniel was praying for the present time. Daniel was praying for the present predicament of the children of Israel. Daniel was praying for the present problems he had about that the people that went back to Jerusalem, they were not allowed to build the temple. Tobiah, Shambhalat, all those people rose up. They hindered the building of the temple and of the walls of Jerusalem. He was praying concerning the present predicament and problems and situation. But then God said, Daniel, I'm going to show you something more than the present. Beyond the present time. That's the reward of the people that have love for God and desire for God and they have passion for souls and they have passion for the kingdom of God. Now I am come to make thee understand. Now I hope you understand because it says in verse 1, I, Daniel, understood. I, Daniel, I had understanding. What did he have understanding of? He had understanding of the present situation. He had understanding of the condition of the children of Israel. He had understanding that the prophecy, the proclamation concerning Israel and Judah will still be fulfilled. And God said, that's all right, Daniel. I'm going to give you understanding not just for one nation of Israel. I'm going to give you understanding for all the nations of the world. When you stay like that in prayer and you wait upon the Lord like that, He expands your course, He enlarges your course. He says, You understand a little. I'm going to give you much, much understanding because the vision is still yet for many, many days. But now you've seen the resistance that uh, that prince uh, encountered, that angel encountered. We're looking at Zechariah chapter 3. Resistance, resistance. When you pray, you're praying for the salvation of people. You are praying for the growth of the church. You are praying for revival, restoration among the people of God. You are praying that the church of the living God will be strong, will be mighty. Resistance may come. Coming from the enemy of the souls of men. Coming from the enemy of righteousness. Coming from the enemy of Christ. The enemy of the kingdom of Christ. That's Satan and the demon host supporting, surrounding Satan. In Zechariah chapter 3 verse 1 and he showed me Joshua, the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and said Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. That's the work of the devil. 
That's the enemy. Not wanting the progress of the people of God. And sometimes people don't understand. There is an invisible personality. There's an angelic demonic angel. That is trying to hinder the progress of the people of God. Christ has said upon this rock I build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And Satan doesn't want that church to be strong. Satan doesn't want that church to be steady and solid on the foundation. Satan doesn't want that church to grow and to expand. And therefore, he will be fighting in the heavenlies. And the fight in the heavenlies will be translated to the fight on ground on earth. And people, when you see that on earth, resistance this way, resistance that way. Oh, you say, what is all this? You think it is the people. It's beyond the people. And sometimes he will even use some sinners that are hiding under the cover of the church. It you seen us that are bench warmers in the church. You use backsliders, the people that do not have any love and any interest for the Lord and for the things of the Lord. He'll use them and they will think that they are just the people doing what they're doing. No, it is not them. It is the devil and it is the demonic host in the heavenlies that is instigating them, inspiring them, influencing them to do the evil they're doing. But as we continue to pray, we're going to win. We're going to overcome. And the church of the living God will keep on making progress in Jesus' name. Then in verse 2 it says, And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee. The Lord rebuke thee. If you will continue to pray, as Daniel continued to pray, if the people of God will continue to inter- intercede for the restoration of backsliders, for the strengthening of the church, for the expansion of the kingdom of God. If the people of God, like Daniel, will continue to pray for the establishment of righteousness in the midst of the church, then the Lord will rebuke the enemy for us. I said he rebuked the enemy for us. The Lord rebuked the old Satan. Even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. Is not this a brand plot out of the fire? And that's what we'll see. Now let's come to the New Testament and see that battle going on. That battle going on. I'm sure you, in some of our, in some of our districts and some of our groups and some of our regions and some of our states, you are planning to have crusade. And you plan to have an outreach. You plan to gather the, the, the sinners to come into the kingdom. And then uh, there will be one problem or the other that will arise. And then you are distracted and you are not able to do that again. Or maybe you are even able to go out and do it. And then you find opposition and resistance there. And resistance there. And then you try to do whatever you are trying to do. And it appears, you know, people are not responding. And you are not having a, break, a breakthrough. Why? There's a resistance. And that resistance is not just the people in that community. It's not the people in those villages. It's not just the people that, you know, in the church are saying, okay, they are going to win other people to the Lord. And we are here. We have this problem and have this problem. And they are not taking care of our problems. And they are looking for people outside. We are not going to cooperate. We are going to hinder it. You think it's just those people. It's beyond those people. The prince of Persia was to that angel. That demonic prince of Persia, an angelic, uh, an angelic uh, personality that didn't want the salvation of Persia and the goodness of God to come upon Persia. That's why I was true. That angel did not want the revelation to come unto Daniel in Second Corinthians chapter four, verse four. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse four. It says, "In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not." The God of this world. You see that is a personality, demonic, satanic, and it's this devilish individual that blinds their eyes and closes their ears, and they cannot hear. And then it says, "Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, shall shine unto them." And look at um, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 it says over here for we wrestle not against principality for we wrestle not against the flesh and blood against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world those are not human agents they're not human rulers they're not human people they're the angelic demonic angels and it says we wrestle against them so it didn't stop at the time of daniel it still went on at the time of the new testament wanting to hinder the preaching of the gospel wanting to hinder the expansion of the church wanting to hinder the establishment of the kingdom of god against the rulers of the of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness and high places but we're going to overcome i said we're going to overcome 
I'm going to show you something now, very important. You need to pay attention. And uh, sometimes, uh, you know, if you understand all this, then you intensify your prayer. If you understand all this, you then look away from man. You, you, you stop shifting blame. It is so and so. It is such and such. That is not allowing us to have this and to have that. Look at this now. First Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2. And you need to, you need to re review, you need to allow the revelation of the Lord to come to your soul, to come to your mind. And look at uh, First Thessalonians chapter two, verse eighteen. It says, "Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, the Thessalonians had received the first impartation of the watch of God." From Paul the Apostle. If you read chapter 1, you'll see that. How our gospel came to you. Look at that in chapter 1 verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in what only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. As ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and are Kaya, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, or not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith, your God word is spread abroad, so that we need not speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we add unto you, how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God, and to wait for the Son, uh, for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come. Paul the apostle had gone there with Silas and uh, Timothy. And uh, the word of God had been preached and there was great revival. And many people were born again and then the people were shining as lights. They were going about and they were witnessing, evangelizing other people. And Paul the apostle said in chapter 2 verse 18, whereof we Paul, uh, Paul said, myself, Silas, and Timothy, we came before, we wanted to come again, would have come unto you. Even I, Paul, once and again, once and again, once and again. What's the meaning of that? Well, we had the first outreach, we came, and I wanted to come again, and then come again, and then come again, and then come again, many, many times. And then it says in verse 18, that is chapter 2, verse 18, tell me the rest of that verse 18. Tell me out loud. Say that again. But Satan hindered us. Paul said, yes, I'm willing to come. Paul said, yes, I wanted to come. Paul said, I pushed all other programs aside, and I wanted to actually do it. And I wanted to come once and come again and come again. But Satan hindered us. That's what you are saying. It didn't end just with Daniel. And you see, instead of the people of God praying, they might be laying blame on Paul. Paul has forgotten us. Paul is not coming. Paul is not as active as he used to be. Paul is not as zealous as he used to be. Paul is losing his interest in us. Paul is not concerned about that other place. Paul is not concerned about Philippi, about Corinth, about this. And Paul is not uh, thinking we're important anymore. Some people will be putting the blame on Paul. But Paul revealed to them, it's not him. He said, but Satan hindered us. You know, if your eyes are not open, you'll be fighting the wrong person. And you'll be opposing the wrong person. Why is it uh, this section is neglected? Why is this and why is that and why is that? But Satan hindered us. Instead of kind of complaining and murmuring, instead of going about and saying, they have forgotten our area, they have forgotten this, they have forgotten that, understand but satan hindered us is the conflict in the heavenlies the conflict is not here it is a fight taking place in the heavenlies up there influencing what is happening down here that you know paul the apostle said a plant and then he looked at his record the other time i should have been in thessalonica and then he looked again i should have been i should have been there now three or four times and they have not been able to visit them again after the after the first time but he revealed the secret to them but satan hindered us but we are going to overcome as daniel overcame we're going to overcome in jesus name 
And now we know the secret. We know what was actually happening. The appearance of the glorious messenger from heaven had a great impact on Daniel. And there remained no strength in me, he said, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption. And I retained no strength. His spirit was overwhelmed. His vigor and natural strength failed him. If the righteous and the, and the greatly beloved, that is Daniel, could not stand in the immediate presence of divine glory, what will happen to sinners at the white throne judgment when they appear before God in his glorious majesty? And behold, an untouch me, he said, the divine touch strengthened him. Then he said, Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened, and said, that my, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. The hand of God's power going along with the word of his grace is able to strengthen you able to make you stand in his presence. He can silence our fears and he can strengthen our hearts with the word of his power. He will do it in Jesus' name. And then that angel now revealed and said, Daniel, you know what? From the first day that you began to set your heart to understand and to chase in thyself before thy God, thy words were heard. And I am come for thy words, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia will stood me one and twenty days. God responded promptly to Daniel's supplication and intercession. Daniel always obtained a prompt answer to his prayers. What caused the three weeks? delay at this time the resistance of a demonic prince of the kingdom of Persia Michael the chief angelic prince the angel assigned and appointed by God to defend and to protect Judah and the, the, and the people of, of Daniel that is the Israelites, Satan, the arch enemy of God and the great adversary of God's people also appoints as, and assigns his evil angels over the nations of the world to oppose and to try to sort God's plan and purpose for his people. I pray he will not hinder our program. He will not hinder our progress. He will not hinder God's plan for our church, for the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name. Do you know that in the early church, that almost happened also in the early church. In the early church, in Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, a great revival came out, broke out. Many people were converted. And then chapter 3, a great, great miracle. A man that was born lame, just silver and gold, by none in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. All of a sudden, when that had happened, many people came to know the Lord again. We're told in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, verse 4, that all the thousands were added unto them. Four, five thousand added again. And then the members of the Sanhedrin rose up. And it took these people, instead of everybody jubilating and praising the Lord, look at this man that was born lame. Now he's rising up and walking. And instead of the joy of the Lord feeding the religious leaders' hearts, instead of that, they held on to those people and threw them into the prison. They said, no, this must not be. Oh, is that, oh, how is that happening? That's because of the a conflict in the heavenlies. And then in chapter 5, Ananas and Sapphira, they brought us something which is a half of what they should bring. While that unity was there, the fellowship was there, the righteousness was there. This uh, couple, they brought in hypocrisy and insincerity and deception just to derail the revival. And then when that was dealt with, still the leaders, religious leaders, came upon those apostles and put them in the prison again. And then when they were thinking they are going to kill them, an angel came from heaven and said, Peter, come out of that place and go and declare to the people all the words of this life. Do you see the conflict? They are preaching. They put them in the prison. The angel comes and put them out. And then in the morning, they said, go and look for those people. They couldn't find them. When they saw them where they were preaching, they arrested them. They brought them and they said, didn't we tell you not to speak in the name of Jesus anymore? You have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. And then Peter replied, they were caught to the heart and they said, we'll kill you. Then you will see. This sin must not continue. It was then Gamaliel rose up and said, don't do this. If this be of God, you cannot overthrow it. Lest you be found fighting against God. But you see the conflict as revival is going on. I pray that God will open our eyes to see 
that one understand when God begins to do something, something great, something wonderful, and is doing it for the church and is doing it for the body of Christ, that we will not allow the conflict in the heavenlies to turn our eyes away from where God wants to also be looking at, we'll all unite together. I said we'll unite together. We'll not allow the devil to break our ranks and then make us to fight one another so that we'll then abandon the work the Lord has given us to do. We're going to continue to work for the Lord. And this revival God is bringing now, it will continue in Jesus' name. Now you understand, if anybody rises up and he says, this will not be, and this will not be, this is not uh, the time to do this, or, uh, you know, doing this and doing that, then you will know it is the response and the result of the conflict in the heavenlies. And then we will intensify our prayers so that the prince that is the demonic prince of Pasha will be overthrown, will be overcome. And then if God needs to send the angels so that the angels will deliver the people of God and release us for the great revival of this end time, those angels will come in Jesus' name. Don't you see how the angels came in the New Testament in the Acts of the Apostles chapter 5? The angel came into the prison, opened the prison doors and said, go and tell them, go and teach them. Don't you see how the angels came? Even how the angel came in chapter 8 when Philip went to that a desert area and the angel said, go join yourself to that chariot. Don't you see the angels in chapter 10 as the angel appeared unto Cornelius and said, this, do this, and send to Simon Peter. Let him come and declare the word unto you. Don't you see how the angel came also unto Peter himself in chapter 12 of Acts of the Apostles? And then he said, Get up. And then when he got up, he got to the place where they were praying. And then he knocked at the door. They will not open the door. And then Rhoda came and said, It is Peter. They said, No, you are mad. Do you see that? Peter was outside. And if those prison people, if they woke up in time and they were searching for him, here he was by the door. The people of God would not open the door. They were still, and they were praying. And yet, the influence of the powers of the air, of the heavenlies, shot their mind to the answer to their prayer. And they were telling Rhoda, you are mad. He said, no. Okay, they said, it is his angel, his angel. Just knocking at the door. Okay, if it's in here, why don't you open the door? But Rhoda kept on saying, no, it is Peter. It is Peter. When they opened the door, they saw Peter. You will see the angels. You'll see the supernatural. Do you remember? Paul was going to Rome. And then there was this storm on the sea. Why? Why is the storm on the sea? Remember, we wanted to come once and again, but Satan hindered us. The storm is because of those demonic personalities. And then eventually again, an angel came and said, Paul, be of good cheer. That you are going, to, as you have borne witness for me in Jerusalem, you are going to be a witness also in Rome. But you see the ministry of the angels to the very end of the chapters of Acts of the Apostles. That's because those people, they were committed to the work the Lord has given them to do. If we are committed to the work the Lord has given us to do, and we don't listen to any contrary voice, any hindrance, anyone that is going to be used of Satan to hinder us and to draw us back, angelic ministry will start in our church again in Jesus' name. And so that is how they were able to overcome. We now come to point number three. We come to point number three because we have seen in the case of Daniel we're perseverance in prayer by Daniel. The, in, the evil angelic prince was defeated. Evil angelic prince will be defeated and uh, totally uh, routed in our life in Jesus' name. The angel from God's presence broke through and came forth to reveal God's unalterable plan to Daniel. That revelation will come to you. Point number three, reassurance of conquering with the prince from heaven. Reassurance of conquering with the prince from heaven. We're looking at Daniel chapter 10, reading from verse 15. Daniel chapter 10, from verse 15. And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground, and I became dumb. And behold, one, like the similitude of the sons of men, touched my leaves. And then I opened my mouth, and spake, and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me, and I retained no strength. For how can the servant of this my Lord talk of this my Lord, for as for me, straightway there remain no strength in me, neither is there breath in me. 
then they came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man and he strengthened me he will strengthen you the task ahead of us it will strengthen us and it's strengthening it's strengthening me too because the whole church at this time i, I know we are praying i said i know we are praying and your, the strength of the lord will never fail me will never fail you in jesus name and all our overseers and all our leaders, coordinators and all our pastors, the strength of the Lord will be multiplied in our lives in Jesus' name. And whatever the angelicals and the demonicals may be planning and fighting in the conflicts in the heavenlies, the Lord is on our side. Christ is on our side. The Holy Ghost is on our side. And the angels are sent as messengers to the ministers and to the members of the, living, of the church of the living God. We're going to be going from strength unto strength in Jesus' name. And as Daniel was strengthened, we're going to remain in strength in Jesus' name. In verse 19, and said, O man, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be unto thee. Be strong, yea, be strong. And when he has spoken unto me, I was strengthened. As you hear the word of God tonight, you will be strengthened. Weakness will vanish away. And all tiredness will go away in Jesus' name. All discouragement as to, can we do that? Can we still have another program? Can we still have crusade? Can we still have this uh, a power night, whatever? All those uh, questions and all those uh, hindrances, everything will go away in Jesus' name. And then he said, and said, let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Verse 20, then he said, knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee, and now will I return to fight of the prince of Persia, and when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of where? Of Grecia shall come. Which means then as uh, the, the Lord had a plan and a purpose for Persia, the, the demonic angels uh, assigned by Satan concerning Persia began to fight that it will not be. It will not be. Uh, he wanted a good relationship because Cyrus, the king of Persia, had favor for the people of Israel. It's like Persia and Israel wanting to unite together, wanting to flow together, wanting to, you know, do something together for the purpose of the propagation of the plan of God. But the, uh, the demonic angel said, no, that will not be. That will not be because it will make the blessing to flow onto Persia. It will also make Israel, the people of God, to be strong. And you know, sometimes the Lord wants to bring unity. He wants to bring fellowship so that the power of God and the strength of the Lord and the light of the knowledge of the gospel will flow Low everywhere, but Satan doesn't like that. That's why I want to bring hindrance. All those hindrances the Lord will destroy in Jesus' name. And you know, sometimes it's between, it may be in the church, like this group of districts and this group of districts, they have been doing things separately. All of a sudden they realize there is strength in unity. There's power, progress in unity. And then they come together and they say, we're going to do this together. And then somebody will just write up in one of the groups and say, no. Let's do our own. Let's let them do their own. They will, will know who is actually having the strength and the anointing and the power. And then with that argument, A will not do anything, B will not do anything because of argument. And it is not their fault. It's the prince of Persia in the heavenlies. But now God is opening our eyes that some of the conflicts we'll see and some of the problems we'll see, some of the disagreements we'll see, we'll think it's that brother, it's a difficult brother. We'll think it's that sister, is never cooperating with anybody. We'll think it's that individual he has bad thoughts he, whatever we are planning it's always bringing you know a contrary idea it's not him it's not her it's the in the heavenlies and if we can overcome those powers and principalities in the heavenlies you'll just find that the person that may say no he'll now say oh yes i agree we're going to do it you say what how you see that in just one minute in just just a little discussion now and just a little explanation everything has changed is because our prayer has totally destroyed the plan of the prince of Persia. and then it says when you are happening something with Persia and there's a position like that and then you come to grecia you think okay grecia is different a different culture and different tradition different understanding there will be no problem again no it says in that verse 20 it says when i'm gone forth lo the prince of grecia also shall come it's everywhere, whether Thessalonica or Ephesus or Philippi or Colossae or Grecia or Sebastia, the princes are there and they want to oppose, but they will not succeed. 
because the word of God will keep on and the, it will cover the land as the waters cover the ocean in Jesus' name. And then it says in verse 21, but I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. It says this is noted already in the scripture of truth and because it is noted, it is going to be fulfilled. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael your prince. Daniel was comforted and greatly strengthened by the angel's reassuring words. Fear not, Daniel. O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be unto thee. Be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened. You will be strengthened. Our church will be strengthened. And the kingdom of God will be strengthened. The body of Christ in this nation will be strengthened in Jesus' name. Christ, who is the great, who is greater than the greatest of angels, has spoken the same reassuring words to each of his disciples. Fear not, therefore, ye are more valued than many sparrows. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Fear not, I am the first and the last. Daniel was not to be afraid. And the presence of angelic messenger from heaven or of the power of the prince of the air opposed to him or to his people. What comfort and what consolation we have in the presence, in the promise, in the power of Christ, our Lord and defender. God's people must not fear the power, must not fear the opposition of the prince of the kingdom of Persia. And, and though the prince of Grisha shall come, ultimate victory is noted in the scripture of truth. Michael, one of the chief princes, Michael, your prince, Michael, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, will eventually defeat the great dragon and his angels. The Israel of God, and we are the Israel of God. The church of the living God, we are the church of the living God. We have nothing to fear. Our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, has conquered Satan and his host, and now it is finished. All these and all these things were more than conquerors through him that loved us. Brothers and sisters, the Lord is on our side. I said the Lord is on our side. But we must not be ignorant of the devices of the enemy. That's why as the church is marching on now, as the church is making progress now, as the church is now taking more territories for the Lord, as the church is binding our hearts, our hands, everything we've got together, and we say, we're going to do more evangelism, and we're going to come once and again, once and again, once and again. Let nobody say this is too much. Let nobody say the programs are too many. Let nobody say the activities are so many. If anybody says that, it is Satan trying to hinder the work of God because Paul the Apostle said we well, wanted to come, wanted to come once and again, but Satan hindered us. Now our eyes are open and now that the secret has been revealed that uh, Satan will not hinder us anymore in Jesus' name. Let's come back to Thessalonians 4 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to read that again in chapter 2 verse 18. First Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 18. Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again. Tell me the rest. But Satan hindered us. What are we to do then? We're to pray like Daniel prayed. We're to pray and continue in prayer like he prayed. And if we pray, that Satan, that devil, that demonic host will be conquered in Jesus' name. Let's look at Second Thessalonians now, chapter 3. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. This is the instruction the Lord has given us, the inspiration the Lord has given us, yeah, what he wants us to do. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, brethren, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Criticize us? Oppose us? Argue against us? Complain against us? Find fault with the programs? What do we do? Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free cause and be glorified even as it is with you, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. He'll keep you from evil. We have won the battle already. 
and all the fight and all the battle, all the conflict in the heavenlies, so that uh, the demonic uh, holds not wanting the knowledge of the word of God to cover this land, they'll be defeated in Jesus' name. And this knowledge and this power, this strength and this revelation will flow to your life, flow to your family. And flow to your local church, flow to your region, flow to your state, and this whole land will come to know that Jesus is Lord and Savior, and there will be revival once again in our land in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. The Lord has opened our eyes to see, and uh, He has answered our prayer that we said it should open our eyes, it should instruct us, it should show us things we never saw before, and He has done that. Let us take that to the Lord in prayer right now and say, Lord, thank you for what you have revealed. Thank you, Lord, for what you have shown us. Now we see the problems we have sometimes. It's not just because of ourselves individually. It's because of that conflict and battle. And it is because of that warfare in the heavenlies. But the Lord is on our side. The Holy Ghost is on our side. The Father is on our side. He wants the victory for us. And therefore that's why you're opening your eyes and you're saying, Yes, I come in agreement. I come in fellowship with the people of God. The work of God must go on. We're not going to allow the hindrance of the enemy and the hindrance of the powers of the air to hinder or to stop or to disturb the work of God open your mouth and pray with all zeal, with all passion, with all interest, with all excitement saying oh Lord here am I, here am I here am I, I'm not going to criticize anymore, I'm not going to oppose anymore, I'm not going to argue anymore, this is the time the Lord wants to visit his people, this is a great thing the Lord is doing and don't allow the devil to make you of you or make use of your friend or make use of any religious man, any religious woman, anybody, anywhere to hinder the progress of the gospel of the Lord. This gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all nations for a witness and then shall the end come with all our hearts, with all our, all our souls calling upon the name of the Lord. Lord, we thank you for your purpose. We thank you for your plan. We thank you for the progress the church is making. And we thank you because of revelation you are giving us, reminding us that you have something to do. And you are giving us a body. You are giving us a body. You are giving us a body in our hearts that this gospel must be preached. This gospel must be preached. This gospel must be preached. And yet what we didn't know, we prayed one day, two days, and three days, why didn't the answer come in time? One week is gone, why didn't all the answer come in time? Two weeks are gone, why didn't the answer come in time? Three weeks now here already. Oh Lord, what is happening? And then revelation comes, the revelation comes. It's because of that battle, that conflict, that warfare in the heavenlies. And it is a continual prayer, importunate prayer, persistent prayer, fervent prayer of the people of God that will defeat all those powers in the heavenlies. Call upon the name of the Lord and say, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, let there be revival. Let there be revival. Manifest yourself so that souls will be saved. Backsliders will be restored. The sick will be healed. Your prayers will be delivered. And those on any affliction, the Lord will come and deliver them. There will be mighty revival, renewal, restoration, regeneration in the land once again. Let's tell the Lord, let's tell the Lord, let the Lord bring the days of revival again, the days of power, the days of authority, when the name of Jesus Christ is mentioned, then yokes are broken, and many people's hearts are touched, people repenting of their sins and calling upon the name of the Lord. Let it be in our day, let it be in our time. Oh Lord, send the revival now, send the revival now. Yes, we know there's conflict in the heavenlies, but all those conflicts in the heavenlies will be, all those things will be scattered by the prayer of the people of God. No more criticism and no more complaint and no more condemnation and no more uh, kind of slander, no more opposition one against another. Pray for us, pray for us, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free cause and then the Lord will send this word with power into the hearts of the people and the Lord will turn many people unto righteousness. This is the time to call upon the Lord. This is the time to pray and to say, Lord, we're asking for that revival. We're asking for that breakthrough that, Lord, many souls will come to know the Lord. 
don't, don't give yourself to the devil to use you as an instrument to hinder the great revival the Lord is bringing in the way of the body of Christ at this time. Just say, yes, Lord, now I understand. Now I understand. And stop blaming the pastor and blaming our overseers and blaming this and blaming that. And why didn't they come? Since that first time they promised us they are going to come. Why didn't they come again? Why didn't they come again? Why didn't they come again? Paul the apostle said, I plan to come. I purpose to come. I desire to come. I push every other thing aside. I wanted to come. Once and again, I would have been with you Thessalonians, but Satan hindered us. It's because of those conflicts. It's because of those battles. It's because of that, that warfare in the heavenlies. And Satan hindered us. It is a prayer of the people of God. It is a passion of the people of God. It's the importunity of the people of God. It is the intercession of the people of God that will scatter all those people that are involved in warfare in the heavenlies. And then we'll be able to release Paul to come. And then he'll come, he'll come, he'll come, he'll come once and again. He'll come once and again. He'll come once and again. And mighty revival will flow all through the land. Stop accusing anybody as to, you know, this the cause and that's the cause. Understand, it is because of the powers of the air, the principalities and the powers. And the prince of Persia, the prince of Russia. Then that's why the hindrances have been there. But now you are telling the Lord, Oh Lord, stop the mouth of that slanderer. Oh Lord, stop all the activities of that prince of Persia. And dislodge them and defeat them and destroy all their intention. Everything they wanted to do so that revival will break through in this land. Don't allow the devil to put anything in your heart that you'll use as an instrument, you'll use as a tool. To bring hindrance to Paul the Apostle or bring hindrance to Timothy or bring hindrance to Silas. But release Paul and release Silas and release Timothy with your prayer. So that the word of God will have free cause. And then great, 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 great mighty things will be done in the land. And don't listen to any figure out there that will say, this is too much. I thought you still, you did this uh, just some weeks ago, some months ago. Why do you need to do that again? Don't you have any other thing to do? Uh, that's the king of Pasha right there, the prince of Pasha right there. Wanting to hinder the free flow of the mighty river of revival flowing everywhere at this time. And you are not going to allow that. You are not going to allow that. You are not going to allow that. You are going to pray until the heavens will be opened once again. You are going to pray until the fountains of the rivers of life eternal will break up again and flow into the communities, into everywhere. Every local government and every state and every city and every village and every hamlet. That this revival will reach out everywhere. That's why the people of God like Daniel are calling upon the Lord in importunate prayer, intercession, persistent intercession until we're going to have a breakthrough to the hearts of the people. The high will be converted. The lowly people will be converted. The educated will be converted. The illiterates will be converted. There will be conversion, regeneration, salvation everywhere. Miracles, signs and wonders everywhere. It is our time. Let the people of God pray. Let the people of God pray. Let the people of God pray. And then like Daniel, if Daniel alone... Daniel alone, Daniel alone was able to bring the power down. Daniel alone was able to make the angel to be released and to come and to show this great revelation. How much more when 1,000 people, 10,000 people, 100,000 people are praying and they're praying for this country. They are praying for the countries of Africa. They are praying for the whole continent and they're saying, oh Lord, let darkness depart. Let light come. Let revival come. Let salvation come. And let revival come upon all the churches. And let souls be saved, souls born again and people knowing the Lord mighty revival of holiness mighty revival of righteousness mighty revival of signs and wonders and miracles once again in this land, if the people of God will pray, my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and they seek my face and they turn from their wicked ways I will hear from heaven when they pray I will heal their land and then he says I forgive their sin this is the time, the time when the Lord wants us to defeat all those powers, all those princes of Persia, all those princes of Grisha, so that 
the mighty power of God will come. A mighty revival will come. And many, many people will come to know the Lord as Lord and Savior. And many people, not only in this denomination, but everywhere, many churches, they come to know the Lord. Righteousness everywhere. Holiness everywhere. Salvation everywhere. Restoration for backsliders everywhere. Healing everywhere. Deliverance everywhere. A great revival that this land has never known. If the people of God will pray, if the people of God will call upon him and say, Lord, we're waiting for it. Lord, we're waiting for it. And the Lord asked Ezekiel and said, can this dry bones live? And he said, oh Lord, thou knowest. And then he said, he commanded him, he said, professor to the bones, they'll come one to another. And as he began to prophesy, then the bone came on a mighty shaking, a mighty trembling. And then it says, prophesy again. And then the flesh and the sinews came upon them and prophesy again unto the winds of the spirit that the spirit of God will come and cover the whole of them. And he began to pray and intercede and preach and proclaim like the Lord had commanded him. And then it says, there's a mighty army that stood up. Why don't we pray that way? Let a mighty army, a mighty army of saved people, a mighty army of sanctified people, a mighty army of spirit baptized people, a mighty army of soul winners, a mighty army of servants of God, a mighty army of people that are taking the gospel everywhere, that a mighty army will rise up. And then we're going to proclaim the gospel from the east to the west, from the north to the south, and every corner of this country and of this continent, when the fire of God will come from the altar of God and come from to every heart. Let the people of God pray. Let the people of God pray. Brethren, we beseech you, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free cause and then that the word of the Lord will strike in the minds of the people that are adding, in the hearts of the people that are backsliding, in the hearts of the people that are sinners, in the hearts of the people that do not know the Lord and then people will be running to the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving themselves unto the Lord. Let it happen. Let it happen. Let it happen. Let the day of revival come. Let the mighty revival come. Let the day of regeneration, restoration, let that day come. Let the day of righteousness and holiness, let that day come. The day of sanctification once again. In every church and in every home, every family. And let the day of mighty revival of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost come upon the people of God and upon individuals, upon the members and the ministers of the church of the living God. Let that day come. It will come as a people of God will pray. Is by prayer, by prayer, by prayer, by prayer. Daniel said, he himself, he said, I mourn, I mourn. Don't you see the condition of the church at large? Doesn't that cause concern? I'm boarding, I'm mourning. And will you not call upon the name of the Lord like Daniel did and say, Oh Lord, oh Lord, bring revival. In the midst of the years, revive thy work. And that is how that mighty revival will break out. And then as you hear that now the hindrance of Satan is taken out of the way. And a program of crusade is coming in, coming in your in your situation. It's coming in your locality. Then you join hands with the people of God. Say, Lord, we're ready. Lord, we're ready. Lord, we're ready. This is our time. This is our time. And then you bring all your resources and everything you've got. And then all your time you bring to the altar. You say, Lord, we're going to do this together. There will be no opposition. There will be no division. There will be no criticism. Everything will just join together. And then we're going to see a great, 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 mighty revival. You tell the Lord, oh Lord, this is the time. This is the time. The time appointed. The time appointed that that revival will come. And it is coming. It is coming. And then after you live here today, you continue the prayer. After you live here today, you continue the prayer. After you live here today, you continue the prayer. And any time you see opposition to the progress of the church, opposition to the evangelism, opposition to the church planting, opposition to the spiritual progress, every time you see that, you say, uh -huh, that is Satan wanting to hinder once again, that is Satan wanting to hinder once again, and then you get on your knees, you get on your feet, you call upon the name of the Lord, and as you pray with passion, Pray with purpose, pray with faith once again. Then angels will be sent from heaven and they will scatter all those emissaries of Satan and all those princes of Persia and Grisha. And the power of the Lord will come once again and roll away the stone. And great will be the revival that will come in the midst of the people of God. You'll be an instrument for that revival, be a tool for that revival, and be a great influence to you for that revival. Be an encouragement to all the people of God. And let's join hands and hearts together that through you and 
and through me and through us together, this revival will break through the land. Will break through the land. There will be no hindrance at all to the flow of the Spirit of God. There will be no hindrance to the flow of the power of the Lord in the midst of the people of God. In the midst of the people of God. Pray and say, Lord, we have waited enough. We have been waiting for a long time. We have been waiting for a long time. Now the time has come for that revival to break out. And Lord, let us see it. Let us see it. Let us see it. In our locality, let us see it. In our region, let us see it. In our state, let us see it. In headquarters, let us see it. Everywhere where the people of God are discerning. Let us see that revival of souls being saved, of the sick being healed, of science.